Oh, Rachel. I'm glad to meet you, Sergey. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming, taking the time, and uh, that, that's my first podcast. So, oh, great. That's a very, oh, I'm uh, Congratulations. Yeah, I had an idea like a month ago, you know, during the ceremony. So I thought, like, okay, I'm going to do it. So <laughs> okay. I'm used to follow <laughs> the medicine's advice. Exactly. We should do what we're told. <laughs> Exactly. Well, you have to kind of, um, you know, think it through, but it's something yeah. you still to consider, you know. Yeah, yeah. I got to do something with my, with all this free time I have at hand right now, you know. So, okay, well, I want to introduce you. I want to share with people how I found you. Yes. Uh, so, one of our guests left your book in our place, and we have a little library, you know, for people to read between the ceremonies and it's a, it's a wonderful way to integrate you know just relaxing reading so one of the books it was yours and uh, one of the guests said did you read this book it's very good and i said <laughs> no i have to be honest no because you know there's no books and there's no much time to read everything so but i look at that i held it in, in my hands and i kind of skipped through it scanned through it and i thought it's a real book and i felt like it deserves attention you know so i uh, read and then i contacted you and asked you to review my book that just got out and thank you for taking time doing this i know sure. that it's no. not easy because i had an honor to review one book in my life so it took time and it was yeah. a friend so I couldn't say no, but it took time and it's an effort, you know, and, it, yeah. you know, so, uh, and it's totally volunteer. So I appreciate that. You're and welcome. I know. I enjoyed reading it. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. So I just wanted to, you know, to talk about your work, your research, your book, how you got to the medicine, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, you know, it's just a conversation. So. So start where you want, and we just, you know, and we just talk. Okay, well, thank you. So, you know, I'll start with my um, falling, ignorantly falling into a ceremony, so to speak. And that is that I was living in New Jersey. You know New Jersey. Yeah, of course. It was, it was February. It was miserable. And I was looking for a station. And so I found through a friend, she told me of a retreat center and I thought, well, that's great. I'll just ignore all the yoga classes and the meditations and I'll go and sit on the beach. And so it was in Costa Rica and I was all set to go. I didn't even look at their schedule or I didn't look at anything, I don't think. Or if I did, it didn't ring any bells. And so a day or two before I'm leaving, the person organizing all the logistics calls me and says, do you want to participate in the ceremonies? And I say, what ceremonies? Because I didn't catch any of the buzzwords. I didn't, I had no idea. And so she said, well, it's an ayahuasca ceremony. And so I happened to have one of Ralph Metzner's books on my shelf. Uh, uh, you know how it is, a book I had bought and never read because I basically liked the art on the cover. So I said, well, let me call you back in 24 hours. And I read the book and I called her back and I said, oh, yes, you can sign me up. <laughs> and so, you know, people talk about how they're called by the medicine. And I guess I think this qualifies. And so I got there and I had this, you know, that first ceremony is often the bonding ceremony. So I had this amazing experience. And had experience with psychedelics in my 20s, but I'd been a householder and raised a daughter and I hadn't done anything in decades. And so this was sort of coming full circle for me, diving back into this altered state. And um, so I had this wonderful experience that helped me resolve my, the experience I had while my father was dying. And so that was very powerful. And it was an ecstatic experience. I mean, I, I went out into the universe and don't remember anything after that. And, uh, and I, I really have not had an experience quite like that since. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, sort of after, these, after that, 
major opening experience, I've been doing ceremonies and the work has been heal all about healing and a lot of um, you know personal history healing and and that sort of thing. And uh, so that first experience really stayed with me. And of course, uh, I you know I'm a, res- a psychologist and a researcher, and I woke up the next morning. And I said, how does this work? <laughs> how did, how was she so, the medicine was so specific, taking me to that time of my father's death. It was a reliving and it was um, therapeutic and ecstatic and loving and, but it was so specific. And I thought, you know, I had had psychedelics before, but never a replay like this, where then I traveled with my father as he was dying. And so that's how I got out into the universe. And, and so, of course, you know, a, a, a northern woman, even with someone translating English into Spanish, the shamans don't want to hear this kind of question. This is not how they work or think. And um, there is no, I mean, I, I, even if it were, there's how, what is the answer? I still don't know. And so after this initial what, what, experience, the question was, how does this work? How does this medicine replicate such a specific experience? How does it open that compartment of my brain? And it's, it was actually what I had asked for, too. It was my intention. I want to go back to that time when my dad was dying the last day, when he was in the, the active process of dying. I wanted to go back to that because it has such a profound effect on me. And um, and then I did other ceremonies, and within a year or two, you know, I'm still totally befuddled about how does this work, and I get, and by now I'm hearing a voice, and I I think well that that's helpful, you know, the voice is helpful, and the voice says do the research, and and so I'm already in that process of doing the research, and I you know so I'm sort of on my way, not realizing that I'm on this ayahuasca journey in my life. I mean, my life is totally taken over by this process. And uh, at one point, you know, I'm I'm 60 some years old and someone asked me if this was a dissertation, the research I was doing. And it's like, no, I did my dissertation 35 years ago. (laughs) You know, that was this is just because I've been called. And um, and so that's where the original research came from. And and one of the questions I asked in that research that had been given to me by this woman shaman who's very sensitive and and refined and intuitive. And she said, well, ask ask your people, do they um, do they have an ongoing relationship with the spirit of ayahuasca? So I hadn't read a lot of books then. I didn't know. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good question. So I asked that question. And then when I'm doing the data analysis and I'm looking at out of 81 subjects, 54 said they had an ongoing relationship with the plant spirit. And I thought I was the only one hearing a voice. You know, I didn't realize every, you know, three quarters of the people did. And so that that just shook me really to my roots. And um, now, of course, I'm more used to that. And I sort of accept it more gracefully and and graciously. And I know we're those of us who do feel that kind of connection going relationship the primary feeling is one of gratitude you know we're so grateful to have that connection and that healing and the help and and so that's really what started me on the journey and so the book grew out of that listening to ayahuasca I mean the book really grew out of that core experience that I had and and I understand that you know I I assume you have a relationship with your primary plant medicine. Yes, of course. It's definitely a relationship. That's exactly how I treat it. And it's something you use, and it's the same way for people, you know. It's something that you you work on. You know? Yes. And over here, you just strengthen, you, you make it stronger, you make it deeper. Yeah. And you, you just learn to listen to it more, you know. Yeah, yeah. Over time. So, um, do you think your research or your dissertation would be 
written differently if you had ayahuasca before writing it? Oh, my dissertation from way back? <laughs> well, that yeah. wasn't related to psychedelics at all. <laughs> but I think psychology, no? That was this. It was psychology, but it wasn't about psychedelics. I I don't think I could have gotten. You, I did it in the seventies. It would never have passed a committee. It wouldn't have gotten through. <laughs> now people can do it, but mm -hmm. back then it would never have been possible. Mm -hmm. But every everything is different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Literally everything is different since since exactly. that. Yeah. That's a, that's a good. That's a good thing that you can now. Uh, implement this into a research and dissertation, something that people couldn't do before. That's becoming yes. possible right now. Yes, that's yes. People are beginning these professional careers studying psychedelics in a way that I could not have done. It's you know, it's now four, 50 years later. So there are opportunities that I I would not have had, and I'm I'm very grateful for this young generation and. And to me, even now, you know, the some of the researchers are 40 and 50 years old, even, and I still think of them as young, young, and they have a career opportunity that I could only have dreamed of. And I'm very excited for them and, and for all of us to be learning so much more. And, and yet, even with all the research that's being done now, I mean, the mystery remains. We don't really understand how these medicines work. And so there's still a lot of mystery surrounding these experiences. I think it's not going to change. This aspect will always remain, regardless how much research you will do. The There'll mystery be mystery. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like maybe we will know more about some, you know, chemical aspect of it, you know, biochemical, but spiritual, I think it's a mystery that will not be solved, and that's the beauty of it. Because there is no more mystery when you kind of solve it. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. Actually, the best the best phrase. Let me see if I can think of this. Um, oh, discontinuous. Um, what was it? It was discontinuous transformation. This was. Um, Oh, you know, my recall is not good these days. This is the father of psychology, William James. Oh, thank God. William James is really the father of psychology, and he wrote in the early, early 1900s. And he talked about discontinuous transformation, where there's a spontaneous leap in, trans in personal transformation. Often it's a, a, a spiritual conversion experience where someone... Uh, has a, a huge religious experience. I mean, people still report spontaneous, what's now called in psychology, a quantum change. Um, and more and more people are talking about their um, independent, you know, un, un, w without any medicines or drugs or anything, having spontaneous um, mystical experiences. It's sort of becoming more, okay, slightly more okay in our culture to talk about it. But, um, that's a perfect phrase, discontinuous transformation, because it's a leap. There's a real leap, and everything is different, and you don't go back. And uh, there were some researchers who looked at, who found people who had had spontaneous mystical experiences. And then, this is a feat of data collection, 10 years later, they interviewed the same group of people again, and they found that the way their values had changed um, remained remained consistent. So they know, you know, before this mystical experience, they were interested in success and consumerism and, you know, achievement and all these sort of external values. And after the mystical experience, they were more interested in what they could contribute to the world and, you know, things for the good of the planet and ecology and social concerns. And, and 10 years later, their values remain consistent. So that's, you know, that's the research that's saying, you know, your values change and they remain changed. You don't, you don't fall back, in other words. It's a long lasting. It's long lasting. It changes the trajectory of a life. And, and you know, I know a lot of people who used 
psychedelics in their 20s because that's when I was exposed to them. And it, it changes the trajectory of a whole life and it also changes how we uh, meet the end of our lives. So I have a, a dear friend who um, had a good bit of experience. He traveled with the Grateful Dead, so you can imagine he had a, a good ex amount of experience in his 20s. And at 70 years old, he had terminal cancer. And he, you know, the story, this is a very intimate community where I live, so we hear intimate things about each other. And he said he was, uh, you know, when the doctor told him this is terminal and maybe you have 12 to 16 months, he, his first response was, I'm ready. I, I, and 70 is young still, in the, as we think at this time. But he said, I'm ready. I've been prepared. And it was all because of the psychedelic experiences when I was in my 20s. And he, he spent his last years engaged in, a, in, a, in, in an art project of building a table by hand. And, you know, he worked with wood all his life. And it was this beautiful carving. And, and uh, you know, people came and visited him. And he, he did the whole process very gracefully. And it was because of those early experiences. So these medicines m make a huge difference in our lives and the way we face death. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very important. You know, talking about that, I lost both of my parents to cancer. And oh. uh, they didn't make it until 60. You know, they were, oh, uh, that's very young. Yeah, and 56. And the cancer was very aggressive. And very sudden, you know, that that was my first um, speak introduction to it, you know, like in the family. And that was, yeah. that was, I uh, saw them fighting for that, for, for life, and that was so dignifying, so humiliating. It, 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 it was just a devastating for body and spirit, you know. Yeah. And, and, I, and I thought that I could help them if there would be physical uh, possibility, because I live in Peru, I live in Israel, so at that time we didn't have, there was no possibility to bring them here, yeah. everything was fast, and, you know, there, there are a lot of obstacles, it, it's not easy just to bring your parents and here is the medicine. No, no. One, we had our first daughter, you know, just like a year old, so, you know, I'm the financial sorry. difficult. That's, and that's so hard. I was watching that over Skype, yeah. literally half an hour time, and I thought that you know if they would have the medicine, the death would go differently. You know, yeah. I'm problem with that. And that's the that's the research they're doing at NYU with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And it does change everything about the process of dying. It even reduces uh, pain, the pain that people experience. And of course, yeah. it changes their attitude, and it and it makes it allows them to be more open in their saying goodbye to loved ones. So you you were right. It's just the logistics were too much. Too much. It just wasn't possible in my case, yeah. you know. But but you know, as much as this is important to help people to pass over, you know, just as much important is to how people live differently. It, it, that, that's my thing. Is my question is like why? Why do we need to wait until we up in a deathbed to have a possibility to experience with psychedelics and plants? How much more beneficial it would be if you start early while we're still alive, while we still have energy for you, while we still have time to change things? It just can improve your life so much and enhance your experience so much that by the time you come to, you know, to your death, you'll be much more prepared. You'll be looking back like, all right, you know, I, I've done it, you know, and I'm yeah. living in, in, in peace. Because it just, the medicine takes you out of this hypnotic cultural trance and brings you to the moment. And then you can start seeing, like, oh my God, my life is moving right now. It's happening right now. So it kind of intensifies your experience. And by, by doing this, it just increases your 
uh, lifespan in a sense. You know, the years are the same, but the experience, mm -hmm. the intense experience is different. Yeah, yeah. And comparing this to a person who just, you know, living without any altered state of consciousness, just very much in the matrix, and then suddenly something happened to you, some, you know, the, the world stops, and you realize that, oh, you know, that's it. it, it it's very shocking. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have a research background, and I was in private practice for about 35 years. And I worked with people who were well-functioning and interested in spiritual development. So it was a, a, a you know, a, a, a small kind of practice. for. And um, so I had a, a lot of experience working with people with their lives and the unfolding. And, and even with that kind of high-level functioning people, th there are things that, d that don't, you know, what I say is um, ayahuasca and the other psychedelics, they do things that don't happen in a therapy office. So, you know, I never had anyone have a mystical experience in my therapy office. You know, they might have had one somewhere else and come and talk about it, but I didn't have an office as a result of the therapy. Also, therapists are no good at getting people to stop with any addictive behaviors. We fail. We, we know that doesn't work. We can't get people to eat better, right? That's why there are all these diet commercial things, because it doesn't happen in a therapy office. So there are things that therapy doesn't do so well. And the plants, the, the psychedelic medicines, actually um, are m much more successful working with those issues. And also with people finding purpose in life and meaning, it really, that's part of the transformation process. And that's certainly existential psychotherapists talk about meaning and purpose in life and priorities and, and your intentions and how does that match your behavior and that sort of thing. But people come at you, I, I'm, you know this, because you've dedicated your life. Your, the purpose and meaning of your life has emerged out of your personal experiences. And this happens with medicines in a way that, that is bigger than what can happen in a therapy office. But I, I do have to say, you know, there's that phrase, one night of ceremony is worth 10 years of therapy. The other side of it is therapy is very good at cleaning up childhood um, issues. Trauma, yes, but issues in general. And, um, you know, here's, here's an example. This was a, a young 40-something, you know, early 40s guy who'd done years and years of ceremonies and really felt, you know, he would say, ayahuasca is my therapist. And then he kind of realized after a number of years that his relationships were not working. They weren't any better than they'd always been. And so he finally said, well, maybe I'll try therapy. And he found a simpatico therapist who knew what he'd been doing and could work with him. And he said, it's been amazing. I can use, the therapy helps me use my experiences and my experiences help open up the therapy and my relationships are improving. And so one does not take the place of the other. They do different things and they can work very well together. But I think it's a mistake to say that the ceremonies can do everything. It's important for a therapist to actually have the experience? You know, I hedged on that in the book. And I said something like, um, you know, they have to have had similar experiences or be open. And then I, I wrote a chapter for a book on psychedelic therapies, and I just came right out and said, no, they need, if, if you're in a path with a plant medicine, go to a therapist who knows, who's experienced that and is in relationship also with that medicine. And what that feels like is that in individual therapy with a therapist and a client in the room, there are three beings present. And the spirit of ayahuasca is there and helpful. 
and therapists will report I say things in those sessions spontaneously that I would never have said otherwise. And so there's a there's extra help. And and it's hard to find a therapist who has that experience, but it's worth looking for one and there're going to be more and more of them. Well, you're one. I'm not I'm not in practice anymore. I'm retired. <laughs> I'm not advertising. No. I say no. Uh-uh. And you don't have I don't clients. have clients. No. No. But okay. I have a I have a dear friend who's in private practice and he's been working closely with a shaman in Peru and he says this is his this is his experience. He's sitting in the therapy room with a client who's been very stuck. He's been very difficult to work with and they're kind of stuck. And he said, and then all of a sudden a snake flew in the window. And he said, since that appearance, <laughs> everything has opened up and gone, you know, extraordinarily well. So it changed the whole, the presence of this spirit changed the whole course of the therapy process. I, I'm curious, how were you looked at when you started working with ayahuasca? You already, you already had your PhD in psychology? Oh, yeah. I know. I'd had it for 30 some years. I, I was really... I was free to do whatever I wanted. I was very close to retirement when I did that study, and by the time it was published, I was retired. So, how your colleagues look at you or heard you? I mean, well, did you have any yeah. conversation? Yeah, you know, I had a co-author on that study, and here, here's how it went. This, you know, research is taught, um, at least for me, I learned it in a research office with a mentor, with a woman psychologist. And, and what I say is 10 years in the office, I didn't write anything that she didn't look at. And we talked about everything. So this was a real hands-on mentor. And um, she had had a mentor who was very prestigious in the field of psychology. He received um, a lifetime award from the American Psychological Association. He was very well known. And um, and he and I had always wanted to do a study together, and we somehow never did. And so when I was beginning this research, it was 2008 or something like that, and he was in his mid-80s. And I talked to him about it, and he was interested and, you know, very warm. I mean, I have this ongoing relationship with him, and, you know, he's very warm and kind about the whole thing. And, and um, then I'm sitting in a ceremony... And I hear this voice involve, <clears throat> the voice says, involve Lee in your research. And I like turn into a snotty 16 year old. And I basically say back, oh yeah, I've talked to him. I've been there. I've done that. Very calmly, the voice comes back and she says, no, involve him in the research. So I call up Lee. I mean, he's been director of research for all the VA hospitals in the country. He's been the director of research for the American Psychiatric Association. He's very well known. And I say, Grandmother Ayahuasca has told me I should involve you in the research. And there's this pause on the phone. And then he says, okay. <laughs> and he's just been very, I mean, this is my colleague who's been the most closely involved. And he's been very open, but he's extraordinary. And when, when we published... I said, Lee, you know, there are really three authors here. <laughs> and he said, I know, but they're not going to publish that. <laughs> That's too much. But, that was, but we both felt that. We both knew. We'd had consultation from her. We knew there were three beings involved in that study. Uh, but <laughs> did you have any, I would like to hear if you had any uh, confrontations with your colleagues in your department or you know other people. well you know I was I was so close to retirement nobody I didn't have any issues come up um, I did I did hear Roland Griffith talking to a medical student and this was like this was way early in the whole process so this was about 2007 say and he was coaching the medical student and the medical student was talking to him and saying I want to you know, I want to focus on, on psychedelics. I want to do research. 
And Roland Griffith said, it'll kill your whole career. Don't do it. And that was true back then. And that's how quickly things have changed. And they've changed because the data is so extraordinary. The findings cannot be argued with. The research has been done very carefully. The findings are so strong that these medicines help. They make a difference. And we're finding they make a difference in all kinds of di with diagnose lots of different diagnoses and situations that it just cannot be ignored. You know, now there's support. There's, there's academic support and there's financial support for the studies. So people are no longer risking their careers. And that all happened in the last dozen years. That's how quickly it's all changed. You know, what's incredible, when, uh, when I was researching the masculine and its relationship uh, with the first half of 20th century uh, researcher, uh, that was in the, in the previous book, I was amazed that I, I was amazed that it was uh, very incredible actually research that was done in the first half of 20th century mm -hmm. was very interesting and very promising and very you know opening and, and then they just they just closed it all in 1971 I think Nixon Nixon signed, uh, the war the, on drugs yeah I, I, and that just that just put an end to research. To, yes, know, that research. that op that opening seemed to be very threatening in the culture. Yes, because it was not just uh, a bunch of uh, guys, you know, taking acid somewhere and dancing around fire. That was this were uh, very known psychiatrists, psychologists. This were people with a, with with a, with a, Strong credential that was looking, were looking into it. Yes. So, and th that's it. And from '71 until now, we have such a gap of what people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Forty years. It's just right. starting to change now. Right. And that so, early data was a lot about treating alcoholics with yes. psychedelics, and it was found to be quite successful. And there was research in England as well and, and other places in Europe. I mean, certainly Stan Groff was doing research in Czechoslovakia. But the data, I mean, the, they weren't doing the kind of statistical analysis that people mm -hmm. do now. But still, clinically, it was, it was very strong um, outcomes. And still, it was just shut down. It was just seen as too threatening. And, and, and the medicine was being used in two different ways. It was, well, it was LSD and psilocybin were being used. And it was being used for a big, exper a big psychedelic experience, a high-dose experience, and also a low-dose. So there was a psychedelic experience and a psycholytic experience. It was a low-dose where you could still sort of have your wits about you so that you could actually engage in therapy or be quiet for a while and then speak. So they, they were using it in these two different ways, one for a big experience and one for an ongoing process of therapy. And I think people are beginning to explore many, a variety of ways of using psychedelics. I mean, certainly people are microdosing, um, but they're, they're beginning to look at low dose experiences as uh, which don't consistently lead to the to the um, mm -hmm. mystical experience, but can be very healing and therapeutic and facilitate the process of psychotherapy. So, I mean, the field is wide open. It's a very exciting time. Yes, the psycholytic, uh, I believe in that very much. I think it's very good. You I know, do too. The, uh, uh, I think you need both. It's both ways. You know, they do something different. Time. Yeah, there is time to have a fully blown psychedelic experience. And there is time for therapy and, you know, microdosing. It, it works. Yes. It's, it, it's shown to be very effective. It just allows, it just brings you in, into a place when you kind of find yourself between two worlds, you know. You're here and you're there, but you're very functional in this reality. And you can... It just, it just allows you to better analyze yourself, you know, it's a very self-reflective, which yeah. leads to therapy and healing. Yes. And then 
you work through some stuff and you're ready to have a powerful experience, then it will come in a better way after this. You, you are more prepared for that. So yes. I see benefits from both. Yes. And, the, and there, the, sometimes, you know, what I call, <coughs> excuse me, what I call, you know, the American um, uh, consistent error is more is better. You know, these are kind of the Wild West. It's, you know, and so there's been a tendency to take higher doses and more is better and more frequently. And, and um, sometimes that's an escape. That's a way to avoid some of the, mm -hmm. um, the, the personal issues that don't come up in that full-blown experience. So the, the, these medicines can be used in a variety of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Escapism means it's part of it. If you're not careful or not aware, it can be used that way. And that's a misuse of the medicine, of course. Yes. You, know, you want to look inside. You want to understand yourself. That's why you do this. Hmm. Yeah, so I, th I think, you know, so the next 10 or 20 that. years, these medicines will be integrated into the profession. They will be integrated into psychology and psychiatry, and, and they will revolutionize everything. Everything will be different. Well, I think uh, the world is ready for this. Uh, you know, wars can take you so far. It's just, it's just the truth of it. And regardless, you can be the best psychologist on the planet, but it's still limiting without actual direct experience. Well, that, that's, that's what I say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah things happen in ceremonies that will never happen in a therapy office. It's different. Yeah. Different. So... I always was saying that the open mind psychology combined with psychedelics and medicines, it's a very powerful combination. And, and the focus of my research and most of my writing is what happens after the ceremony. I, 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 I never interviewed people in terms of, you know, what happened during the ceremony. There's plenty of that. Um, but what happens after the ceremony? How do you work with what you've been given? Yeah, the integration and, is very important. Well, you, you know, into, I, I don't even like that. That word has lost meaning because it's been, it's, <laughs> it's a little snotty on my part, but I sort of say it's sort of like a spa integration. You know, you rest, you journal you know, maybe get a massage, you walk in the woods, you're in nature. And that's that's sort of the spa approach to integration. But it's a prime time for therapy and to really take a look at at what what you received, what you saw, what you experienced, how it connects in your life, what your your new perspective is. And if we don't really work with it, we can lose it. It loses meaning. We forget some stuff. Um, and so it's, I, I, I would like to see, you know, the, the research, for instance, with MDMA that MAPS is doing, they're trying to make it as cost effective as possible. So that means limiting the amount of research and, the, and limiting the amount of therapy, rather. And so the therapy is mostly supportive for the experience. But it's not part of an ongoing therapeutic process. And, um, and they're still getting incredible results, but it's not optimum. It might be the most cost-effective approach, which is what they need, but it may not be optimum. So if somebody has the resources to do, and this is how a lot of people use ceremonies, is maybe they do a couple a year, or at the beginning they do one a month, or, you know, they do one a year, but it's an ongoing process in their life that extends over time when they're in therapy, they're out of therapy, they're back in therapy, that this is an ongoing process of personal evolution. 
and and maturing and you know learning to manage who ourselves and relate to life in a different way so i mean ideally and if you think about it how have you used it how have i used it you know it's an ongoing process i mean for the you know n- now i can speak more freely because i am retired this is what kind of gives me this opportunity but since that first ceremony i've had a you know number of ceremonies every year and so there's this unfolding and this process and um it's been very very helpful in my life and and that's after having had lots of therapy before because as a therapist i also had my own therapy so you know i was not on on virgin territory so to speak but it was it was uh it was working with some of my history in a very different way you just mentioned about prime time after the ceremony in your experience what do you think that prime time uh means in terms of actual days weeks months what is the prime time well we we certainly know it's those those first couple of days and then it it there's a fading and we know for instance just looking at the serotonin levels that for the initial antidepressant response we know that subsides the serotonin levels go down and that's just one sign of it and they go down within 2 weeks um so you can measure that actually yeah that's been measured mm-hmm. uh but i you know i think it fades naturally and normally and so it's a question of what we choose to do with it and and there's a there's just a process so let me talk about my own addiction to junk food mm-hmm. you know so this is you know anything with sugar in it basically or that ends up I, being I sugar share it with you i'm on the same page <laughs> I'm, i'm sorry guilty, i'm sinful <laughs> yes all all the above and so i've got 15 years of ayahuasca ceremonies i would say and and the and the the ironic part of it is I never drank very much. I would drink maybe half an inch or an inch of wine with a meal sometimes in a social situation. I never drank very much. And this past year, I can't even drink that much. So it's like I didn't even need help with that. You know, no thank you. But, you know, I really don't drink at all now, which is sort of, you know, the bad joke of it. But I have to say I am finally making progress. <laughs> And I am not craving sugar and junk food and candy and not, let's throw potato chips in there too i don't have that craving anymore and it's I, and it took me a while to realize i'm different so it wasn't like i came out of one ceremony and thought you know my addiction is cured i'm no i no longer have the palate of a 10 year old which is how i describe myself um but it's i i can i, I now feel on pretty firm territory <laughs> that i'm i'm really different in relationship to those addictive junk foods but look at all these years and i and i have to tell you at one point um grandmother ayahuasca had told me again and again stop stop eating that crap and i tried i didn't have control over it and then i get the message where this is a totally different ceremony a year or so later and she says Now I know she doesn't talk to everyone like this. You know, we each have our own versions, but she says to me, "I underestimated your childhood history. I understand why you can't follow my directions. You can't do, do what I'm saying." And I was like so relieved. I mean, it was bad news to get that kind of diagnostic evaluation from a plant medicine. It's like, "Oh, I'm worse than you thought." <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Thanks I can't help lot. you. <laughs> right. Okay, you can be what you are. Can't help it, you. It was such a relief. And then frankly, it was still a lot of years later for me to report now I think I've really shifted. Doesn't mean I never touch junk food, but I'm this not a compulsion. It's not yeah. over much. It's it's different. It's and I can't it's not like I've lost a lot of weight either. That didn't happen. <laughs> but i'm i'm healthier i know i'm healthier and so that's 
you know, that's my own process. And look at those years. I had the same thing, you know, a sugar addiction is very powerful. Actually, I think it's just as strong as heroin addiction. <laughs> it's pretty it's strong. It. I can tell you something, something even that. I had easier time to get off heroin when I was 17. Oh, really? Time, yeah, than I was uh, dealing with sugar all my life. It was just so much harder. And mm -hmm. now I'm in my early 40s, and now I reasonably have control over it. You know, yeah. sometimes I, I allow myself to to do right. it, but it's not, as you say, the craving is not there. It's more control now, you know. Right. But it was very strong. It's like a very strong possession of the yeah. demons of sugar cane. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, very strong. So, right. Right. Yeah. Well, it took me my whole life, basically. <laughs> but I needed, I needed that. help. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, <laughs> anything else that you would like to share? Like something um, most interesting, uh, working with people during the research and uh, some kind of observation, like in terms of what kind of change you see most in people or you have seen that after ayahuasca? Ceremony. Well, it's it it is it is as everybody reports that the, their mood is improved, they're less depressed, less anxious. That's that's all true. And and uh, for some people, one ceremony will do that. So yes, the research shows that the serotonin goes down, but for some people, one ceremony is enough. And. Um, and that changes everything. If they're less depressed, they're more open, they're more available, their relationships improve, um, they can relate to people easier, they're more, they're more social and connected, they're more present. I mean, this is really a lot of change, and I've heard, I've heard that from people after just one session. So, I mean, there are these what I call miracle cures, where it seems like one session is enough. I think for most people, there's kind of a process of opening up, uh, and um, the, and and there's a different relationship to nature. I mean, you're 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 living in the midst of the wilderness, right? You're in a natural in the mountains, yes. In the mountains, I'm I'm on an island off the coast of Maine that is very protected. I mean, more than half the island is. A wilderness forest. park, yeah, it's yeah, it's forest, and and I, I was just actually, you know, before I got here, I was sitting with some people out on a deck, and we were talking, and and, and these are seasonal people, and they were saying, you know, we've never been here more than a month at a time. They come for their annual vacation, and they said, do you get used to all this beauty? You know, we're sitting there looking over the harbor and. And there are a few houses, but not many, and nobody drove, you know, there are very few, there are less than a dozen people out here on this side of the island. It's very, very quiet. And they asked, do you just begin to take it for granted? And the, the other people of us who were there who stay here for six, seven, eight months, you know, we all said, no, we don't take it for granted. We don't habituate to the beauty. It's almost as if we turn the corner and we're surprised every time. And the relationship to nature changes. And so a group of us had been walking every morning and and really looking at the the day to day changes in nature. And, you know, we're now in the midst of fall. So the leaves are changing and the trees are becoming bare and noticing the small differences every day. It, the whole relationship to nature changes. So, yes, I you know. I have high hopes that as more people open in these kinds of ways, it, the ecological awareness will shift and we'll have a greater commitment to taking care of the planet. Absolutely. I, I feel very strongly. Yes. That, that's coming through the medicine very strongly, you know, connection to nature, a desire for preservation, you know, you just, you just, become, you just feel it. Yes. And uh, I related very much what you're saying about uh, not taking for granted the beauty. Yeah. These mountains that I see every day for nearly 12 years now, I see them just as beautiful as the first day I came here. Yeah. I love 
them, I love each of them, they're all different, they're all beautiful. It's just the relation to them. The, and it, so it, you... It's you, so renewed. Yes, right. And do you have a relationship with the spirit of each mountain? Is it... Is yeah. there that? No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go that far. It's just a general mountain spirit. Yeah. You know, that I connect very strongly. And I'm a city guy. You know, I was born in a city. I live in a city. In, in all the countries that I live, it was city life. So for uh -huh. me, mountain is a completely different world. Yeah. And my idea was always being, you know, living in the ocean somewhere. Or, you know, I love the ocean. I love the sunset. So... So mountains, I thought, well, oh, maybe it's a bit too dry for me, you know. And when I came here, I, I just, I just felt very much home. Yeah. So like, this is, this is my elements here, you know. So good here. Feel finally at home after being for four countries, you know. Yeah. Finally, yeah. I can say it's, it's a big thing to say that. Yes, when it's you, a big thing. You arrive with the constant feeling of being homeless. And not because you don't have place to live. You have. Apartment. I understand. But right. being home spiritually, you know, like you don't know where you right. belong. Right. Right. You think finally all the place at home, and that came through the medicine. One of the things. Yes. And everything came through medicine, and uh, my family and everything. You know. Yeah. So well, I have a lot of only gratitude for that. And when I, it's interesting that me and you, we were called the medicine the same year. It was 2005. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, I had yeah. my third ayahuasca in Wachuma. I came to Peru for five weeks. It was uh, December 2005. 15 uh -huh. years. And yeah. you, I think it was February. Yes, correct. 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 Yeah. So it's interesting how yes. different people come to the medicine from different walks of life and right. different perspectives and different professions and different genders and ages. And then how the medicine transforms each yeah. person in a unique way. It's very interesting to observe yeah, that. Right. One thing I want to ask you before I forget, uh, do you think that, you know, when we talk about this prime time after ceremonies and the, the certain level goes down and a person kind of relapsed, do you really think it all has to do with certain or you see that it's beyond that? Well, that's, you know, it's, it's yes and, <laughs> yes, it's about the serotonin and <laughs> there's the mystery. And, and that we really don't understand. Uh, and, and, and there, with an alive new relationship, a, a, sp a spiritual relationship with a plant teacher, that then becomes ongoing and people you know connect to to that presence in through meditation and in dreams and 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 so there's an ongoing process that happens and uh, i know you know in writing the the listening to ayahuasca book i had help i i had a lot of help with that book and it and you know things just happen serendipitously and I know I had help with that book. And so that's a different life. Would you like to share something about writing the book? Or did you have any... You know, you know, I, I was, I was, I, the, I think it's chapter eight. It's a, it's a chapter on brain research. And this is, you know, this is not my area. So I was, I had read a lot. I'd studied it, but I needed a neurologist to look at it. I needed a cognitive science to look at it. And I thought, you know, I'm one or two people away from the Dalai Lama, but I don't know anyone who knows a cognitive scientist. <laughs> and then an old, old friend of mine, someone I've known for 50 years, I'm in California, she comes to Berkeley to visit her mother, and she says, oh yeah, I know a cognitive scientist who's experienced with ayahuasca. He'll probably look at your chapter. <laughs> and? And he looked at the chapter and he made one correction on, on, a, on a reference. <laughs> he didn't change the sentence. And we're now good friends. <laughs> so now I do know a cognitive scientist. But I felt this, this serendipitousness of that, I mean, it happened within a week. It was very fast it happened. 
And he was willing to do it, which takes time, as you know. It's 25, 30 pages of dense material, and, and, um, and there's nothing in it for him to do it. And he did it as a favor. It was just a generosity. And so I, ha I had help. And that's a different, it's a different life to live with that kind of help, spiritual help in the world. You know, a few years ago, I had, uh, during the ceremonies, I had, I, I was starting to, to receive these messages about uh, trying to gather a, an academic, you know, scholars, uh, neuroscientists, psychologists, uh, people who are serious in their um, research career, and to bring them here and drink medicine together and just see what happens. You know, that's, that was that was the idea, and I still have that. I still hold this vision, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it can be very interesting to actually to let people experience the medicine and write about this and talk about this. And, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the research from inside kind of thing. You have to be the subject to experience mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, just observer. Right, right. You know, Jeremy Narby brought three scientists to Peru. Do, do you remember reading about that? Uh, no. Yeah, this is his story. He brought three scientists to see if their, if their experience and ceremony would help them with their research, research. studies. Mm -hmm. And two out of three of them said yes. They, they, they were able to see things in a new way that gave, led to a breakthrough. And the man, those were the two women, and the man said no, it didn't make a difference. <laughs> But, you know, it, nobody bats a thousand. And there's a, a woman from Australia who's a, a biologist who um, has had an... It, it, now, she's, her career has been harmed because she's written about how uh, plant medicine has helped to guide her research on plants. And she came to some very interesting scientific breakthroughs. But she's... she's uh, her career has been harmed because of she's been open about the source of her inspiration. I can I, I can't retrieve her name right now, but I can send it to you if you want. It's a really interesting story. I would love to talk to her about this if she Yeah. Because, yeah. But, but don't you think it's it, it's it's weird that the results don't matter, but the method is so what the the result kind of exactly. Uh, the method override the results. I mean, as a scientist, I'm not a scientist, but just logically speaking, if I would be presented with a work that lead to some breakthrough in healing therapy, whatever, whatever is the case, I wouldn't. And, and, and the person would say, you know, I went to the forest, ate some plant, and I came up with it. It's like, that does not invalidate right. the result. Right. It's like the same thing with mental aid. He went to sleep, and then he woke up, and the whole table. Yes. Was so. Right, right. You would the think table it would is still be there. The order is still there. The research is still there. Right. You have great references about that in your book, about these kind of breakthrough experiences that scientists have. Yeah, I'll send you her name. She. That would be yeah. Interesting to talk to her if that's possible, because you see, that's that's just a bias. Yes. It's a very biased, um, you know, attitude to research, you know. It's right, they didn't, you're awesome. exactly right. They didn't question her data. They right, didn't like, they did right. there, but right. the methods are unacceptable. But, right. So if, if, you, if you have a dream and the angel tells you about uh, something and you wake up, I mean, what about this card? I mean, the whole, the whole thing that he came with was inspired by angelic voices in a dream. Right. They hold the scientific method. So the science feel comfortable to use that for five hundred years. But <laughs> but not the angel. Not the we'll angel. Just, we'll just know? ignore the angel. Yeah. Just ignore the angels and just use the scientific method. I mean this is where we are still, you know? Um, we are still in that yes. place. That's something that I think needs to be changed. The the methods are valid if they lead to valid results. We have a ways to go. You know, here here in the States, we're, you know, it's a very tense time between 
you know, the virus, the COVID-19 and, and the presidential election. We have quite a ways to go. <laughs> yeah, the psychedelic <laughs> research taking a back seat right now. Right now. <laughs> but I will get back to it, you know, yeah. because it's yeah. a very valid uh, subject. You, know, you cannot ignore this. It's, right. As you said in the beginning, the, the, the data is overwhelming. You yeah. cannot ignore it easily anymore as, oh, right. this is... Uh, this is crazy, this is drugs, uh, yeah. it's just serious people are involved and the more people uh, with solid background coming forward, the, the harder it will be to reject them. Yes, yes. So, um, anything else you would like to add? You know, you know, the current project I'm working on is I've been interviewing women uh, elders who have been psychedelic guides for at least 20 years. So these are the women from the underground. So when Michael Pollan, um, be, you know, began research for his book, these are the people he went to. And um, so I've been interviewing them. I'm the first person that they've talked to because they're very, very quiet and discreet. And, you know, they've been at decades. They could lose, you know, their whole life could come tumbling down. And, um, and they all have... Uh, relationships to the plant spirits there so they a it'll be a new book yeah but that's the one thing that they all have in common is that relationship with the whether they're angels or plant spirits or whatever they are there's a relationship with the non-human realm mm -hmm. well i'm looking forward to read that book <laughs> I hope to write it. I'm um, just the beginning. <laughs> uh, okay. How long it took you to write a uh, listening to ayahuasca book? You know, um, Joe Tafur asked me that question. You know Joe Tafur? No. It's, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll send you his email. Um, so he wrote Fellowship of the River. He's a medical doctor, Colombian American. Mm -hmm. And he asked me that question at a, at a big conference. I, I had just met him and he went up to the, to the microphone to ask me this. And the honest answer is 10 years. Wow. And he, he said his book also took 10 years that because so much of it came out of my own lived experience. And um, that, was a, that was a big project for me. That's a serious commitment. Y yes, yes. It's a, well, you know, out of our own experiences, we make a pretty big commitment, right? Can I? <laughs> it's true for you too, isn't it? <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. Yes, yes. But I just don't know if I would write a book over ten years. I don't know. That would be very hard to. to it's keep. a different. It's a different kind of book. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any time when you thought like you will never finish it? No, no. I had help, <laughs> so I never doubted. <laughs> well, I, um, I I recommend your book very much. I, I find it to be very good, very well researched, very honest, very sincere, very well written. I really think people need to read that before uh, considering to drink ayahuasca. Well, thank you. I'm very glad it ended up at your retreat center. I, I wrote yeah. it and I hoped it would be of help to people. Well, it's right here. I can show you right here. <laughs> And I'm glad tell, you have it. You can tell the way it looks. Oh, can... yes, that's great. <laughs> that makes me very happy. <laughs> it doesn't look like new from the store. <laughs> that's great. It was Thank bad. you so much. <laughs> well, anything else you would like to say? Um, no. no, I mean, I could give the same warnings, you know, be careful where you go and all that. And I certainly hope people are very, very careful. But I, there's a lot of that information out. And I, I just, you know, I appreciate how you've really dedicated your life. And, um, you know, it's really lovely to meet you in person. Thank you. Thank and that you. comes through in your writing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a labor of love, you know. I just, I just write from my heart. So. Yes. So yeah, thank you for it. your feedback. So <laughs> last question. What, when did you drink ayahuasca last time? Well, you know, um, I, I'm taking the, I'm taking, uh, 
the extract every morning and evening. So I had three or four drops of the uh, extract of the ayahuasca vine this morning. So that's the answer to that's the honest answer to that. Now that's not a ceremony. <laughs> that is psycholytic, but <laughs> but it's a very small uh, amount. There's no there's no you know it doesn't change my consciousness, but it keeps me connected. Mm -hmm. So because of COVID, it's been longer than I like. It's been over a year. Mm -hmm. So are you planning to continue to work with ayahuasca? I will. Yes, I. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the shaman I work with has done, um, uh, you know, uh, um, ceremonies over the Internet with no medicine. Mm -hmm. Just he's he's trained indigenously and uh, he grew up in an indigenous village. And so even though he's American, he, mm -hmm. he lived in an indigenous village until he was 15 and had a godfather who trained him. And um, so the ceremony that he did over the internet, he just sang. There was no medicine involved. And the, the songs, the Icaros, are medicine also. Mm -hmm. And so that came through. It was really wonderful. Uh, so the connection, sure. The connection comes through. Well, very good that you are microdosing. It's very helpful, especially during this, this crazy time. It's good to have access to to the medicine in any shape or form. Yes, I'm very grateful for it. You know, yeah. I'm in the same position, you know. Um, and if, when this all COVID started in March, yeah. it was uh, it was difficult for everyone, you know. And um, for the first month, I didn't take the medicine. Uh, I was kind of so disconnected because everything that was happening, you know. And then I just called the calling and uh, I went by myself and in the first ceremony things changed. It took me out of it right away in the first time. I, I felt I got myself back, my sense of self, my strength, all came back and I thought, like, whoa, that was a dark month for um, me personally, you yeah. know. And so I thought, oh, I need to drink even though we don't have people, the roots on the, on the lockdown, I still have to do it myself. So, I was doing medicine here and there and wrote a book, so I, I stayed connected. And what I started seeing after, um, I had a few Peruvian people coming to drink, and um, I saw an incredible relief from stress and fear, even yes. with one ceremony. It's right. such a few people come with one face and they leave, smile, energized, connected. Yeah. Like the medicine just takes you out of it, all, all out of the fear matrix. You know, in one yeah. day, I yeah. can see, you know, so it's very important to continue whatever is your choice, microdosing or right. one experience, but to have right. the connection very important with, during this time, it's always good, but now it's, it's a necessity more than just, yes. you know, before it was a privilege, today it's a necessity, that's how right. it's, so right, I'm it does help, yeah, yeah, so, very Rachel, so, so thank you. <laughs> well, I enjoy very much talking to you. And, it's been lovely uh, to meet you. Thank you very much, and I uh, wish you all the best from Peru, and let's keep in touch. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergey. Thank you.